Hey, everybody. This video is going to go over the PowerPoint in the week four module on values and assumptions, part one. Okay. Um, values and assumptions are such a big part of argument. Um, there's so much ground to cover. So I wanted to split it up into two PowerPoints, two videos, so that you could kind of, um, you know, take in everything from the first one and then move on and, you know, listen to everything in the second one. So this video is for values and assumptions part one. Um, and the thing about values and assumptions is that uh, they lurk underneath an argument. Um, and most people are unaware that they're there um, or they, they, they don't pay attention to it. So, but in order to really understand an argument, um, you have to be aware of its hidden layers because that's actually where the biggest force of the argument is. Um, it's really what gives the argument its power are the values and assumptions in those hidden layers the, 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 that we don't, that aren't so obvious. Um, you know, we rely on the values and assumptions to draw the audience in, to get them to trust our support and proofs that we're using, and ultimately to accept our claim. And you can have the most impressive array of um, support and proofs. You know, you can have all the evidence and examples you want, uh, but um, if you do not successfully appeal to common values or predict common assumptions that the audience might have, then your argument will probably still fall flat. So really, values and assumptions are the driving force of arguments. Um, they provide a logical connection between your claim and your support. Um, every argument has an assumption, at least one, that is crucial to making it a valid argument. Um, sometimes the assumptions actually are stated in the argument, but more often they're not. Um, in fact, they can go, they can be so deeply and quietly, even in the arguer's mind, that he or she might not even recognize them themselves because the values and assumptions we're talking about are a part of our makeup culturally, right? Um, through society, our interactions with each other. And these values and assumptions go far beyond argument. Those values are there regardless of argument. And that's why it's so easy to miss them in argument because they're just such a, a part of who we are in the first place, right? But a good arguer knows that and a good arguer will tap into those values and assumptions. Um, so I have on uh, slide four here, an example of an unstated assumption to kind of give you a feel for what I'm talking about here. So we have a claim, right? You should dress nicely for your interview because you want to make a good impression. So if we break that down into the claim and the support, the claim is you should dress nicely for your interview. That's what we're trying to convince the other person of. The support we're using, how we're trying to convince them to do it is you want to make a good impression on the employer, right? But inside that argument lies an unstated assumption that is so widely accepted that it doesn't even need to be stated, but it's still there. The assumption is that being dressed nicely will make a good impression. That's the assumption. We assume that any quality employer would want a potential employee to be dressed nicely, that it would make a good impression on that employer. 
if that assumption is false, then the claim falls apart. If employers really don't care how you're dressed and that really doesn't make much of an impression on them, then dressing nicely for the interview really isn't necessary, right? So the assumption links the claim and the support. It, it helps us accept both of them. Um, in this particular example, the assumption probably is pretty widely accepted. That still doesn't necessarily make it true, <laughs> but it is widely accepted. Um, and therefore, most people in most situations aren't going to dispute it. They will accept this claim. However, in a lot of arguments, um, the assumptions are debatable and highly questionable at times. And we're going to look at a few examples of those as well. So if you go to slide five, we have an argument here. We should invade Vietnam before the communists take it over and the American way of life is threatened. The claim, what we're trying to convince the audience of, is that we should invade Vietnam before the communists take over. What and when, right? The support we're using to try to convince them is that the communists will threaten the American way of life. So inside that argument is a debatable assumption. So if the communists take over Vietnam, the American way of life will be threatened. That's the assumption. We need to invade before they take over, because if they do take over, the American way of life will be threatened. Um, however, that assumption is not necessarily universally accepted. It is debatable. The assumption itself, that the, the thing that ties the claim and the support together, isn't necessarily uh, uh, strong enough to convince everyone. And you can see why, you know, in the 60s and 70s, why so many Americans protested the Vietnam War. Because for them, the assumption was questionable. Um, they did not necessarily believe that communists taking over in a really small Southeast Asian country would have any effect on their own way of life. So that was not, that, that assumption didn't work to make, you know, to cause them to accept the claim that we should go to war, right? Um, that leads us to another model or tool that we can use to analyze argument and to think about our own arguments, and it's what we call the Tolman model. Um, so Stephen Tolman was a British philosopher, and he developed this system for analyzing argument and he looks at all the different parts of an argument and the one area that he focuses on really well that can help us are what he calls warrants and you're going to see it's basically what we've been talking about assumptions so the Tolman model gives us a way of looking at an understanding argument it defines the essential parts of an argument it explains the relationship among each part of an argument and provides us a tool for evaluating argument. Um, and it's a very practical model because basically it follows nor like pretty traditional human thought process, right? So the six parts of an argument that Tolman says are there, the six parts, uh, claim, warrant, support and grounds, backing, qualifiers, and rebuttals. Now, if you're on slide seven, when you when you look at that slide, you'll see that three out of those six are in white boxes with pink lettering. And the other three are in pink boxes with white lettering. So they're kind of separated. And the three that are in the pink boxes claim, warrant, and support and grounds, those three elements are essential to any argument. They are present in every argument. You make a claim, you give support, and there is a warrant there somewhere lurking underneath that ties the claim and the support together. 
the assumptions that the arguer and the audience perhaps share, but maybe not. Backing qualifiers and rebuttals might be present in the argument. It just depends on how the argument is being presented. If you're presenting it in essay form, um, then not all six elements are necessarily going to be there. If we're talking about a debate, then probably all six elements will be there because you have a give and take, a back and forth. And in the moment you are presenting arguments and defending and, and shooting down the other person's arguments. So it allows for all six elements to be present. But those three that are in pink, claim, warrant, and support, those three elements are always present in any argument, okay? Um, we're gonna sh look at each part and some of them we're gonna spend a little more time on, but we're gonna try to understand all six elements of the Toulmin model, okay? So the first two, claim and support, we have already discussed those. We know what a claim is and we know what support is and we know how both function in an argument. So we're gonna go ahead and take a look at the other four terms that Toulmin uses. So the first of those other four are warrants. And we have already talked about it a little bit at the beginning of this video. The warrants are the assumptions. They are the principles and the values and the shared ideas or beliefs. They can persuade, help persuade the reader. They can establish common ground. And if the assumptions are faulty, it can help us identify the flaws in an argument. They can strengthen the claim and its connection to the support. They really do the heavy lifting of supporting your claim and making sure that the audience is going to accept the claim and accept that the support truly does support the claim. Um, warrants are sometimes super obvious, so they, they aren't stated as part of the claim or as part of the argument. Um, and sometimes they're not apparent on the surface and sometimes it's hard to identify them at all. You really have to dig and figure out what those underlying assumptions really are. So we have, um, you know, warrants the assumptions, they link the support to the claim, um, they, they help show how the support is relevant. Um, so you wanna look back and forth between your claim and your support and you wanna ask yourself, why does my support mean my claim is true? How does the support demonstrate that my claim is true? And what else must I believe in order to connect the support to the claim? A good warrant is a reasonable interpretation of facts. It is a logical extension of thought and it does not assume more than what your evidence supports. This is the part where you are relying on what you assume the audience thinks and feels and believes in order to get them to accept your support and ultimately then your claim. There are two types of warrants. There's a logical warrant. Um, it compels or guarantees the conclusion that you're arguing for. And one way to identify the warrant is using the if-then proposition. So we have an example here. So the president of the US is doing a poor job because the economy is the worst it's been in 10 years. So the claim is the president is doing a poor job. That's what we're trying to convince our audience of. We want them to agree that the president is doing a poor job. What support are we using to convince them that the economy is the worst it has been in 10 years? Now, what are we assuming about our audience if we're expecting them or hoping that they will accept the claim, that they will agree with us? Well, the first thing you do is you use that if then, okay? 
if the economy is the worst it has been in 10 years, then the president is doing a poor job. That's the logical warrant. But the, the, the second type of warrants are what we call contextual warrants. These are the ones that are based on our broader assumptions and our beliefs and our values. Um, they're not gonna be based in traditional logic <laughs> um, because it's, it's not about logic, it's about our shared values. And if the audience does share these assumptions, does hold these values, then they'll be more likely to accept the claim. So in that same example with the president, looking at those value assumptions, you know, you can, the president is doing a poor job. That's our claim. That's what we want to convince people of. We're trying to use our support as the economy is the worst it has been in 10 years. So the first contextual warrant, what are we expecting the audience to believe and value? Well, the, the belief that the president is responsible for the economy. If we're trying to say that he's doing a bad job because the economy is bad, then we have to, we expect the audience to think that the economy is his job, that he's responsible for it. Um, there's also the assumption that the economy is a good marker of how a president is doing. That it's kind of like one of the main things you look at to know whether or not a president is uh, succeeding or not. And then there's also, you know, if, if, if you're trying to say he's a bad president because the economy is the worst it's been in 10 years, then you really are assuming that the audience also thinks that the economy is the worst it's been in 10 years. Um, so there's a lot that the audience has to believe and, and, and share with you in order for this claim to be accepted. Because what if the audience doesn't think that the economy is really the president's responsibility, that there are so many other people and organizations involved in a good economy that we can't hold just the president responsible for it. Um, and what if we're thinking, you know, we're in the audience and we're thinking, you know what, like there are so many other things that to look at to say whether or not a president is doing a good job. The economy is just one of a thousand things that the president is involved in. And we could look at so many other areas where he is successful and he's doing a good job. Well, then we're certainly not going to agree that the president is doing a poor job just because of the economy. What if we're sitting in the audience and we're like, dude, what are you talking about? The economy's fine. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm doing good. I have a good paying job. I'm paying my bills. My family's doing great. You know, we're able to go on vacation. We just bought a new car. You know, we're not really in that much debt except for the, like, the loans on our cars and our houses maybe. You know, the economy, what do you mean the economy is the worst it's been in 10 years? We're doing great. <laughs> okay, if you have that person in your audience, they are certainly not going to accept your claim that the president is doing a poor job. So you really have to be careful of those warrants, those assumptions that are connecting your claim to your support. Are they sound? Will the audience agree? Will they share those beliefs and values? And will they share those same assumptions? Because if they don't, then you're going to have a hard time persuading them to agree with you. So we have a couple more examples here of warrants. So our claim in this example on slide 14 is businesses have a compelling interest in opposing environmental protection laws. The support we're going to use to try to convince our readers of this is that obeying environmental protection laws that call for clean air, for example, costs industry money that could otherwise be seen as profit. So using our if then, we can see that the logical warrant is if obeying environmental laws that could uh, would cost industries money that could be seen as profit, then businesses have a compelling interest in opposing them. Profits are a higher, you know, we're basically saying if profits are a higher priority for businesses than environmental concerns are, 
when making decisions about their operations, then this claim is true, right? The contextual warrants, those values, those assumptions, are one, the first one is the widely held belief that profits should stand as the primary measure of a business's success. And then there's also the common uh, assumption that financial considerations and environmental concerns, money and environment, are usually in tension with each other. So if you have people in your audience, though, that don't share those assumptions, then they're not necessarily going to agree with your claim. They have to also think that environment and money are at odds. And they also have to believe that how much money a business makes is its primary measure of success. Um, and we also have to assume that money is the, high, the highest priority for businesses. If we don't believe any of those things, well, this argue might, argument might fail on us. So we have a couple more examples of weak warrants. So, so far the examples that we've looked at, although we could possibly disagree with the warrant, with those assumptions, um, there's still a lot of people out there who would agree or disagree. But sometimes the warrants, those assumptions are really weak. And the, the, the person making the argument has really stretched or has not thought through the whole assumption yet. So we have a claim here. The appeal process for criminals should be shortened. That's what we're trying to convince people of. The appeals process needs to be shorter. Why? What is our support? Well, the appeals for criminals on death row can cost more than $2 million per criminal. So our expected warrants. If, if we are making this argument that the appeals process should be shorter because the appeals for death row inmates can be more than $2 million per criminal, what we are expecting our audience to value and believe are in the left-hand column here on slide 15, the expected warrants. So the expected logical warrant is if a criminal appeal costs more than $2 million per criminal, then the appeals process should be shortened. $2 million, and you do the contextual warrant. $2 million is an unreasonably high price to pay for a criminal appeal, and the process could be shortened without sacrificing how fair or effective it is. There are things we should, that we could definitely do to make the process shorter, to make it cost less money, and still give those individuals a fair shot at an appeal. Um, if that's how we feel, then we're going to share the, the, you know, we share the author's warrant and we're going to accept the claim. So the argument would be convincing to us. However, this might not be as strong as we think it is on, at, at first glance. So the alternative warrant says, if a criminal appeal costs more than $2 million per criminal, then a remedy other than shortening the appeals process should be found. Not that it should be shortened, something else should be done. No, the contextual warrant is, wait a minute, no amount of money is too much to ensure a, fail, a fair appeals process and shortening the process would detract from its fairness and effectiveness. So this individual is supplying different warrants. They have different beliefs and values and they are, they are assuming different things than what the author was. Therefore, the argument is not going to be convincing, right? Um, so the warrants, again, these are the often unstated assumptions underneath the argument, linking the claim to the support. Sometimes it's so obvious and so widely accepted that we don't think twice about it. But just realize that there are situations where 
that warrant, that assumption, that underneath layer isn't really sound. And um, if we really look at it closely, we can see that the, that the author was perhaps assuming too much about us as audience members, or that they simply assumed wrongly <laughs> about us and that we don't share those values, we don't share those assumptions that connect the claim to the support, right? So the next element of the Toolman model, so we had claim, support, warrants. Now we're going to look at backing. It's really strange because the backing is the support for the warrant. If it's there in the argument, and remember, backing is the one that was one of the three that might not be there. If it is there, it's to help convince the audience to accept the warrant, right? So. We have this underneath layer of assumptions and beliefs and values that are connecting the claim to the support. And we realize that, you know, we don't know for sure that the audience is gonna feel the same way and share those same values. Um, we know we, we need to take one extra step to convince them that's what backing does, right? Um, it's not the support and the proof that you're using to prove your point or your claim. It's just another layer of explanation to help the reader accept the warrant that ties the claim and the support together. So it's almost like you can have all of this, you know, fabulous support and proof to to support each of your main ideas and your overall claim. But if you can't get your reader to go past the claim and the warrant, the assumptions that are built in, then they won't even get to this over here. Do you know what I mean? They won't even think about this because they've already disagreed with you in how you have presented the claim. All right. So, the backing simply supports the warrant so that the audience will accept the warrant. Um, you should always look for them. And as an arguer, you should always consider your audience and ask yourself if they are likely to accept your warrant or if you need to provide backing to help justify it. We're gonna take a look here at some examples. So we have a claim here. Immigrants should be allowed to come into the U.S. Our support is immigration has benefited the U.S. economy in the past. So our logical warrant there is if immigration has benefited the U.S. economy in the past, then immigrate, immigrants should be allowed to come into the U.S. now. Our contextual warrants, the assumptions that are underlying, um, well, if we're going to say that they should be allowed to come now because they've benefited us in the past economically, um, then we must assume that current economic conditions are similar to past conditions, that not enough has changed from the past to now. So therefore, you know, the, having immigrants in the country would have the same effect on the economy. Um, we also have to share the assumption that immigrant immigration policy should be developed based on economic need, that that's the biggest reason um, going into the debate on immigration. If we don't share those warrants, we may not move forward. So the backing though, um, if this is our argument, we're making this claim that immigrants should be allowed to come into the U.S. And we're saying the reason is because immigration has benefited the U.S. economy in the past. And we take a look at that warrant that's there in our claim, in our argument, and we're like, well, you know, what if people don't think that the current economic conditions are like those of the past? Hmm. Um, and what if they really don't think that immigration policy should be dictated by economic need. What else can I add to this to further convince them? 
We could add on, now, as in the past, immigrants are willing to perform necessary low-paying jobs that American citizens do not want. Immigrants perform these jobs better than citizens and for less pay. Thus, their inclusion in the workforce is better for the American economy overall. Okay, so we're backing up our warrant there and pointing out that it, it, it is like the past and that economic need is a, a big concern when it comes to the immigration policy. So the backing helps support the warrant. It's not always going to be there, but if you are concerned that your readers aren't going to accept your warrant, then you can provide the backing to help kind of seal the deal a little more. The next part of the Tolman model is the rebuttal. Um, this is, a rebuttal establishes what is wrong with the argument, what is invalid about it, what's unacceptable about it. Um, so the rebuttal would come from the opposition, right? Uh, it's what the opposition would say in response to your claim. And then you would give your counter argument, right? <laughs> uh, so your counter argument is shooting down what the opposition might say. The opposition is giving you a rebuttal. That's what they're saying. Um, it Rebuttals can still show up in an argument even when the opposition is not there. Uh, it can still show up when the arguer is anticipating what the opposition might say, which we, you know, we talked about. Um, you often notice a rebuttal coming when you read things like some may disagree, but, you know, or others may think blah, blah, blah. Um, other commonly held opinions are blah, blah, blah. And then they'll give the opposing idea and then the reasons for rejecting those opposing ideas. So the rebuttal is pretty important because it helps set up the opposition and how you're going to address the opposition, right? But again, it's not always there in an argument. It should be there in yours though, for the course project. Um, so we have an original argument here. The claim is immigrants should be allowed to come into the U.S. because immigration has benefited the U.S. economy in the past. Now, as in the past, immigrants are willing to perform necessary low-paying jobs that American citizens do not want. Immigrants perform these jobs better than citizens and for less pay. Thus, the inclusion, their inclusion in the workforce is better for the American economy overall. So the rebuttal, what the opposition might say is, actually, immigrants actually drain more resources in schooling, medical care, and other social services than they contribute in taxes and productivity. Um, so their argument then would be, no, immigrants should not be allowed to come into the U.S. Instead, law should be passed to limit immigration because immigrants put a strain on our economy and we have our own unskilled laborers who need those jobs. So the rebuttal leads to the opposition's claim, uh, which has its own argument. It has its own claim and support and warrants, right? So if you really get into the layers of an argument, it goes on and on. And each rebuttal and counter argument is almost like the start of a new argument. But it's all in one big argument. It can go on and on. So the opposition comes at you and says, no, 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 no. They actually are a drain on the economy in other ways. And it's really not true that they're performing these jobs that Americans won't, because Americans will. <laughs> what are you going to do? Now you have to qualify your argument, because they kind of made a good point, right? Maybe, at least, you know, we're assuming that we're looking at their claim and saying, okay, you make a good point. What can I do to still save face and still have the audience accept my original claim. Um, well, the first thing you have to remember is that argument is not supposed to demonstrate certainties. It is supposed to demonstrate possibilities, probabilities. The language of certainty 
promises too much. Um, when you are writing a persuasive essay, an argumentative essay, you do not want the language of certainty. You don't want to say always or never or the best or, well, sometimes you can say the best. Depends on what type of essay you're writing um, or what type of argument you're presenting. Uh, you don't want to make it seem like it's black or white. You have to, the, the best claims allow for the gray area. So instead of saying um, always or never, you say sometimes or often, right? Uh, and we do this in our own personal lives too, you know. Um, I know people in my life who, when they are making an argument, stating a claim, something, they use the language of absolute certainty. You always say that, or you always do that. Every time we go here, this is what happened. And they never win those arguments because they're in the land of absolutes. If they were to say, this, you know, this happens so often when we come to this place. Yeah, you're right, it does. <laughs> yeah, there's been a few times where it hasn't happened, but you're right, it, it, for the most part, it, it does, it often happens. See how just changing the language, the wording, makes the claim more acceptable. That's what we're talking about here. Qualifiers take your claim from the land of certainty to the land of probability. So it's not always, it's often. It's not never, it's rarely. Um, it's not is, it's might be, right? All, nope, many or some, none, probably very rarely is it ever actually none. How about just a few? <laughs> um, absolutely, nothing is ever absolute in argument. So it's probably or possibly. So the qualifiers are what we add to our claim to take it from the land of uh, certainty into the land of probability and make it more palatable, make it more acceptable. All right, so it, it's not absolutely certain. It's mostly certain most of the time. Um, so we have the original claim that we used in slides 17 through 19 about the immigration argument. So the original claim, if you remember, was immigrants should be allowed to come into the U.S. Our support was, you know, they benefit the economy just like they have in the past. And, you know, they do jobs that Americans aren't willing to do. And then there was the rebuttal. No, actually, they drain the economy in these ways. And there are Americans who are willing to do those jobs. So no, we should not allow immigrants to come to the country. So then we take a step back and like, okay, maybe we need to restate our claim because they are bringing up some good points. Um, okay, immigrants should be allowed to enter the United States only if they can prove they already have jobs yielding sufficient income to offset social services, you know, all the different government supports that the counter argument that the opposition brought up uh, and if no American citizens are currently available to perform these jobs. Well, it made the claim more complicated for sure, but perhaps more acceptable because now we're not just saying, yes, immigrants should always be allowed to come into the country no matter what. And we're not on the, you know, the other extreme saying immigrants should never be allowed, right? Uh, now we've kind of reached perhaps a, a, a more acceptable statement. That's what a qualifier does. Um, on slide 22, I give you a list of some qualifiers, commonly used ones, um, that you can, you know, perhaps come back and refer to to reword your claims um, and get them into the land of probability. And then the last slide of the PowerPoint is a cartoon, um, and I asked you to take a look at it and kind of use the Toolman model to analyze it. So we have a woman grocery shopping. She's pushing her cart along, and she comes up to the, you know, she's in the produce section, and she comes up to a stand, a display of oranges, and there's a sign 
coming out of the oranges sticking up that says oranges hand picked by US workers three for $20. Um, what is the claim? What is the argument that's being presented here? Well, um, I think we go back to the sample claims that we were looking at in slides 17 through 19. Um, it goes kind of with that argument. Um, so the original claim was that immigrants should be allowed to enter the US uh, because they, as in the past, they help the American economy. And I guess this claim is if we don't allow immigrants into the country to, you know, to do these migrant jobs, then the um, Americans will pay more for their produce because we'd have to pay American workers more money than the immigrants. I guess that's what it says. Um, it's it's a cartoon, so it's there. There's also a layer of sarcasm to it that is not easily cut through. That's, you know, like, are you misreading it? Is it really sarcasm? Maybe they're being dead serious. I'm not sure. Um, so you kind of have to allow for both possibilities. Um, what is the support? The support, you know, it, it, the, if the claim is that immigrants should be allowed to come into the country, the support is the oranges. Because if we don't, we're going to end up paying, you know, three for $20 in oranges, which is ridiculous. Um, what are the warrants? What are we assuming about the audience? Well, we're assuming they don't want to pay $20 for three oranges. Um, we're assuming that they really would cost three for $20 just because the work is being is now being done by um, Americans. That might not be true, right? So that is an assumption. That's a warrant. Uh, what is the backing? Is there anything there to get us to accept the warrant? I would say the backing, because it is a cartoon, it's a visual. The backing might be what we can see of the woman's face. You know, she's not looking down at the oranges, so they're, they don't have her interest right now. The sign does. Um, you can see how her head is positioned. She's looking at the sign, and she's not picking up any oranges and putting them in her cart. So I think that's the backing here. The backing is... Um, you know, nobody's going to pay $3 or $20 for three oranges. So that's, that's helping support the warrant. The warrant being that if we don't allow immigrants into the country that, you know, we'll, we'll end up paying too much because we'll have to pay American workers too much. How do we know that? And how do, how are we supporting that warrant? Her. She's she's the she's the backing. Um, are there any rebuttals or qualifiers present? I don't think so. Um, in this particular one, uh, unless you know, if we had the argument, someone saying immigrants should be allowed into the U.S. Um, you know, they help the economy, and someone is saying no, they they really don't. Plus, you know. There are plenty of American workers to do these jobs, and you know most Americans would prefer, you know, to make sure that Americans have jobs first. And this could be the rebuttal. This could be, um, no, nope, I don't think so, because sure, the, all the Americans have jobs, but we're now charging twenty dollars for three oranges, and nobody's gonna be happy about that. That could be the rebuttal. It's again, it's a cartoon, um, but. It does present a claim and a support, and there are warrants under there. And I think that the, the image does provide some backing in her reaction. Um, so just one example of how to use the Toolman model, but what we really want to take away from this are the warrants and the, the, those underlying values and assumptions that we have when we are presenting our argument and that we are hoping or guessing or assuming our audience has as well. Um, because if they don't share our warrant, then we're less likely to persuade them. 
So um, that is assumptions and values part one. If you have any questions about this, um, feel free to let me know. I do suggest going ahead though and watching, uh, going over the next PowerPoint and video lesson, part two of values and assumptions. And then if you still have any questions, get in touch with me and I'll try to help clarify things for you, okay? Um, go ahead and you guys are free to go on to the next PowerPoint and video lesson.